Hey guys, so this weird contraption that I'm sitting in is called a Your VR, and this is a Kickstarter project that uh, came to my attention about three or four months ago. Now the Kickstarter actually started up back in 2018, but a couple of guys in my Discord community actually put me onto this, and my uh, nerdy instincts immediately told me that this is something that I wanted to check out. Typically speaking, motion platforms for sim racing are very, very expensive and offer a very limited range of movement. Now, where this is different is this actually actually has 360 degrees of rotation. So I can actually spin all the way around. Obviously it's focused on uh, VR use. So you'd be wearing a VR headset, hence it doesn't have to have a monitor or anything like that attached to it. Now, one of the current limitations with motion platforms for sim racing specifically is their limited range of movement. Now, if you look at a industrial multi-million dollar sim rig, they have basically 360 degrees of freedom, meaning they can pitch, roll and yaw and rotate and do them infinitely to produce sustained G-force. Now in our sim racing rigs that we have at home, obviously with the limited range of movement, it becomes impossible to convey sustained G-force, meaning when you're cornering, so if you're turning to the right, normally your body in a real car would be kind of rolling to the left and you'd feel that force in your body. Now, in this rig, obviously we do have a limited range of movement from side to side or roll, but we do have 360 degrees of yaw. Now, one of the things that our brain is particularly good at doing is interpreting different sorts of stimulus in different ways. So what I'm wondering with this rig in particular is whether the 360 degrees of yaw can actually sort of somewhat compensate for the lack of sustained G-force in a sim racing environment and give us that little bit of extra immersion that we would otherwise be missing. And for the price at $1,490, I think it's going to be really interesting to see how this thing stacks up against other more dedicated sim racing platforms. So let's get stuck into it. So the box shipped all the way from Hungary. So I was very happy to see that it was well packaged, came in sort of like this wooden crate kind of assembly, all open. There was no bagging or anything like that around the outside, but everything was individually wrapped and nothing was damaged, I'm happy to say. So getting started with a closer look at some of the components here. This is the footrest or pedal tray. We'll unwrap the other mounting plates as well. Now those reminded me of my days working in an office job as well. <laughs> Now these are used to mount the wheel to the wheel deck as well as a handbrake or anything like that, any other accessories, joysticks and things like that. 4.3 millimeters thick for all of the various different panels here. So the pedal plate or the footrest as well as the wheel deck and uh, joystick mount. And then we have the main sort of mounting arm that comes off the front of the unit. So this also has a positioning system built into it as well. So there's a little on off switch here, a little USB port there as well for charging it up. You can see a little sensor of some description on the side there. I'm not sure exactly how this works. And then a little light on the front as well. And we'll show you that in detail a little bit later on in the video. And then we get on to the main event. So more packaging here. We've got the seat back, which comes with the pro version. And then we lift the outer shell out of the crate as well to reveal the motor assembly. So we unwrap and remove the base. And it actually wasn't as heavy as I thought it might be. And then remove the final mounting arm, which is for the wheel deck or joystick deck. And then a couple of little plastic mounting grommets, which we'll get into a little bit later on too. So it's quite an interesting design. You've got these three little caster wheels, which aren't connected to anything. They're just sort of supports. And then you've got the three motorized wheels, which are obviously what makes the bowl move around inside the assembly. Just to note as well, the outer shell is just a thin polycarbonate, very similar to the shell that you'd find on a radio control car or something like that. So onto the IO panel, we've got an emergency stop jack. We've got a key as well for switching it on and off, an ethernet port, an IEC power connector, a rocker switch for on and off. And that is about it. Now, interestingly, there was no emergency stop switch actually included in the box at all. So I'm not quite sure what the story is there, but yeah, it just appears to be a three and a half mil jack to switch it on and off. Through my mind. So sitting down in it, I was actually quite surprised with the range of movement that this thing has. It's going to be pretty extreme, I think, once we get this thing up and running. Now, 
it doesn't come with any printed instructions, but the assembly guide that's available on their website was pretty clear and self-explanatory, so it wasn't too difficult to put things together. One thing I did notice, however, is that most of the screw holes ended up needing to be drilled out just to sort of get the screws to fit through them. This was a case with this bracket here that you can see with the uh, footrest. So I actually ended up having problems with thread binding. The screw could go through, but because of the thread binding, I wasn't able to tighten it down enough. So I ended up drilling it out ever so slightly just to allow the screw to come through without binding and that allowed me to tighten things down a lot tighter. Then onto the solid seat back and headrest. So this is a optional accessory that comes with the pro version of the platform. So you won't have this included in the basic version. Again, I had to drill out the holes just to make the screws go through so I didn't have any issues with thread binding. And I had a little bit of an issue with getting these two holes to line up as well once we screw things together. Not too difficult, got there in the end, but just a little bit of sort of wiggling things around just to get things lined up. So then we mount the upper portion of the headrest using the four screws. So you kind of want to determine exactly the position you're going to want to have it in and then screw it into position. So you've got a range of holes on the side here to raise it and lower it. and then three holes along the bottom to adjust the angle. Now what I found is the position I actually wanted to have this in, the closest to the uh, to the end here, they haven't accounted for the thickness of the fabric, so it was actually impossible to get the screw through in that position without drilling a new hole. So what I ended up doing was just adjusting it back a little bit. It was still comfortable, it was still okay, but I would have preferred to have that other hole line up. So jumping back down to the wheel mounting or joystick mounting platform here, you can see again, having problems with the screw fitting through, you can see it's sort of been forced through in the factory. So there was quite quite a bit of this sort of thing that I had to do to get things to fit together, which was quite disappointing for a product that costs as much as this does. I really feel like they need to do a better job in the factory of, you know, just finalizing the finish so that things fit together and provide a better experience for the end user. This is something you're only gonna have to deal with once as you're assembling it. But yeah, you don't usually come across this sort of problem on things that cost this much money. So it was a little bit disappointing. see here is two different mounting positions which does allow quite a large scope of adjustability for the overall position of the wheel or joystick. You also have a range of 77 millimeters up and down as well to add a little bit of additional height and then we mount the wheel or joystick deck on top of this using four screws. Again wasn't able to fit these through, had to drill them out again. And then we can get to mounting our wheel. So 
So taking a closer look at this mounting system, this is where I started to have some pretty serious concerns around using this for sim racing. Again, there is quite a large range of adjustability here, but you can see when I sit down in the rig, it's designed so you can sort of unclamp it, lift it off to get in and out of the rig nice and easily. But unfortunately, there's no way of locking this down into position. So this means that when driving, the wheel does move around quite a bit. And if you're not careful, you can actually lift it out and have it move completely forward on you, which is definitely less than ideal. I also found that the quick release mechanism on the side didn't give me enough strength even tightened down to the point where I couldn't tighten it any further to actually stop it from just sliding forward and back as you can see in the video here so yeah I, I, I think based on what I've seen already just from the setup process this is gonna be a hard sell for sim racing I think it really misses the mark here in terms of what you need for a solid sim rig I think that there's definitely potential but I think honestly if this is going to be considered a product that's suitable for sim racing then they definitely need to come up with a better system I think it'd probably be fine for a joystick or flight simulators things like that but for sim driving definitely uh, yeah missing the mark at the moment the footrest as well doesn't have any provision at all for mounting pedals so we are gonna have to fabricate some sort of a bracket or some sort of a wooden block system or something like that that we can use to mount our pedals down later on as well so moving on to getting things connected now standard IEC connection for power and then we also have an Ethernet port as well that needs to be connected to your home network so no wireless functionality now interestingly here when I plugged in the Ethernet port I found the connection was wobbling around quite a lot and then when I sort of tugged on it a little bit it actually broke right off in my hand as you can see here But yeah, I definitely feel like if this was going to be something that was going to be used in a commercial environment with lots of people jumping in and out of it and potentially stepping on cables and stuff like that, certainly not ideal to have things like that happening. Anyway, moving on, we got it all fired up and up and running. All right, so we got things put together and we did run into a few issues with the assembly that we just taken you through. But what I wanted to do now is sort of take you through the hardware as a whole in a little bit more detail. Now, as I said at the start of the video, we are looking at this specifically for the context of this video, at least from the perspective of a sim racer. Now, obviously, you know, through, throughout the process of putting this together, we can see that this isn't something that's been designed primarily for sim racing. So I want you guys to kind of keep that in the back of your mind as we're doing this. We will definitely split this up into multiple videos, I think, and do more videos sort of focusing on the VR experience overall in different types of games as well. But we want to keep this one more to just sort of sim racing experience and the hardware side of things there. So having a look at the, uh, the capsule, so to speak, in a bit more detail, I think it's actually a pretty clever um, clever design overall. So just come down here and have a closer look at the pod itself. So the first thing that really impresses me is the fact that it is so light and portable. Considering that it's giving you 360 degrees of freedom in terms of movement, rotationally at least, in terms of your, you know, considering that it can do all that and the fact that I can just pick this up, you know, it really, it probably only weighs maybe 10, 15 kilos. It's really quite light. And the base isn't very heavy either at all. So it's like, it's something that you can actually pick up and pack up in the corner of your house or you know I don't know how Jill would feel about that I don't know whether she'd agree she's shaking her head behind the camera now but if you had a storage place that you could actually fit this you know you could pack it away and then you know not use it for six months bring it out again and you'd be perfectly fine which is pretty cool and I think we have to kind of keep that in mind this is you know very unique in terms of what it offers most other solutions that offer this amount of movement are you know going to be a lot more expensive and a much more permanent sort of solution that you might find you know, in an arcade or something like that. So I think it's very cool from that perspective. Just come in again, have a closer look. So the pot itself actually has a pretty cool design. It's got this little bit of padding on the inside as well. That's not gonna stop you from hurting yourself by any means. It's still very solid, but it gives it a nice finish rather than just sort of being raw material underneath. Now, the cushioning itself, pretty soft. It's got this kind of velvety finish on the fabric, pretty loose on the fabric side of things, but you know, again, for the money, you wouldn't expect a whole lot more. It's not really, you know, couch quality or anything like that, but it's perfectly adequate for what it is. It doesn't feel like it's going to rip or tear. And we've got an aircraft style seat belt here as well. So quickly latch that up for you as well. So that just clicks in, lift to release exactly like you would find on an airplane. I don't really know whether that makes things safer or not, to be honest with you. I feel like if it was going to roll over, you'd probably actually want to be ejected from it rather than being strapped into it and have it land on top of you. But it has a seat belt if you need it. Um, we'll, we'll find out later on whether we are actually going to need that seatbelt or not. But um, yeah, it does really have quite a huge range of movement there that it moves around, which is quite uh, 
I'm actually feeling a little bit nervous about trying it out for the first time. But yeah, the, the pod itself is actually very solid. There's no, there's no flex in that or anything like that. It doesn't feel like it's gonna distort or, uh, you know, break on you. It's got this sort of mechanism here that slots in, but there's no way to sort of clamp it into position once it's, once it's mounted. So, you know, if, you, if you're driving, I'll just move my arm up out of the way of the camera. If you're driving, you know, if you, if you lift the wheel up, it's just gonna come straight out. And that really, you know, I feel like there needs to be a better solution for that. Even some sort of a latching mechanism underneath here, or even if it was similar to the part that we have up here where it just has a quick release, like on a bicycle where you can just slide it out when you want to adjust it or when you want to remove it and then just slide it back in again so it's actually locked in position and can't move. That would be a lot better. Now it does have a large range of adjustability. So if we loosen off this part, you can see we've got 7.7 .7 centimeters or 77 millimeters of adjustment here. So we can go up and down. We can, you know, move from front to back here as well. So, you know, it moves around a lot, but even at its highest adjustment, so even if we put it up like this and then like that, tilt it forward a little bit here as well, tighten that quick release. When I put my feet up on the pedal plate, you can see my knees are still interfering with the wheel deck here. So yeah, look, I, again, this isn't designed first and foremost as a sim racing piece of equipment. And I think that's very clear in the you know in when we're evaluating it that that's it's kind of a bit of an afterthought so i've been thinking long and hard over the last couple of days about exactly how to sort of tackle the rest of this review now when i originally approached your vr about doing this review i made it very clear to them that i was approaching it from the perspective of a sim racer that you know you guys the majority of my audience are sim racers as well these days and uh, you know that was sort of what we were going to be evaluating first and foremost now obviously throughout the assembly process you guys could see for yourself and we talked about it a little bit earlier on in the video as well it became very clear that this product is designed primarily as a sort of all-round device that's suitable for all types of different sorts of implementations and that's you know sim racing more specifically was a bit more not necessarily an afterthought, but something that was sort of tagged on as an additional extra rather than something that was fundamental to the design of this unit. Now, from putting this together and from my little bit of testing that I've done over the last couple of days, I can tell you that, you know, the amount of flexibility and the amount of movement that we have in the wheel deck definitely diminishes significantly from the overall potential of the unit in terms of the movement, the vibration, and all of the effects that you feel through the unit. To the point where I feel like I can't really accurately evaluate the product as it sits right now for sim racing specifically. So what we're going to do is uh, for, the, for the next video, I'll take you through the software calibration and you know, all the setup and things like that because I think it is still important to cover those things for the people that are interested in this product in a you know more broader sense and then we'll take a look at it from the perspective of using it as more of a sort of passive device so something that you might find in a museum as a sort of experience something like that where you're putting on a vr headset and you know being transported into another world or riding on a roller coaster or something like that we'll also take a look at it from the perspective of somebody using it with vr hand controllers maybe even take a flight sim for a spin with hand controllers as well to see how that runs so yeah i feel like that's that's deserving of a separate video, but I wanted to sort of address the elephant in the room, which is the fact that, you know, with the amount of flexibility that we do have here at the moment, I really can't recommend this as a sim racing product, so to speak. Now, what I have done is I've emailed your VR, let them know the issues that I'm having with it, and I'll continue to sort of try and work with them and see whether we're able to come up with a better solution, maybe a sim racers package or something like that, that is, you know, able to offer a better experience for sim racing more specifically. And uh, like I can tell you that so far, my communication with your VR has been fantastic. I know that, you know, a lot of people get a little bit nervous about startup companies it can be a bit hit and miss sometimes but honestly all of my communication with them right from the very first email where i sort of expressed interest in reviewing the product has all been positive there's been no issues there whatsoever so if you're watching this and maybe interested in buying one of these for other purposes maybe commercial purposes or something like that i can tell you that i've had absolutely no issues with dealing with your vr directly at least in my experience they've been really really excellent to deal with now i also just wanted to quickly touch on the broken ethernet port that i showed you guys before now when I'm reviewing products, and I've been doing this kind of thing for a very long time, it's pretty normal, you know, for things to go wrong, things to break. And, you know, you guys have seen it in some videos before in the past. Now, what I normally do is if it's something that is obviously, you know, something that is just broken, like it's a defective product or something that's, you know, out of the ordinary or something that is a one-off, I normally won't include it in the video and I'll reach out to the company, get them to send me a replacement and everything is fine. But where I draw the line is where it's, you know, where it's something that's obviously, you know, using a cheap quality part that is prone to breaking. And the reason why I included that in this particular video is because that's that particular unit, that little ethernet adapter port is very cheap plastic 
fantastic. And I do feel like it is something that needs to be improved by your VR. I think, you know, particularly given the fact that this product kind of lends itself to a more commercial sort of environment, I think they really do need to get on top of those little bits and pieces to really provide better quality so that we don't see issues like that into the future. So I'm going to leave it at that for today's video. Sorry that it hasn't turned out to be exactly what I expected, but I do want to be fair to the guys at your VR as well as being fair to you guys in conveying a accurate message across to you in terms of evaluating the product. And I feel like I really can't do that until we deal with the issues with the amount of flexibility in the wheel deck. So once that's dealt with, we'll come back, we'll definitely revisit this and see whether it can provide a good sim racing experience once we've dealt with those issues. So thanks very much for watching guys. We will revisit this soon and I'll see you guys again soon. Bye.